Sarah, well let's um, have our Bibles open and uh, you might like to just have the outline there as well and I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together this morning. Thank you for giving to us the scriptures. We thank you that the scriptures are God-breathed and able to make us wise for salvation. So we ask that you would speak words to us this morning that are timely and needful and helpful and wonderful. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as Sarah has said, um, our theme uh, this morning is the faithfulness of God and uh, our text is Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Now, you might think that the book of Jeremiah is a rather unlikely place uh, in which to find an encouraging, upbeat message on the faithfulness of God. Because on the whole, uh, Jeremiah can be a rather depressing read. It is essentially a book about judgment, and uh, Jeremiah the man is sometimes known as the weeping prophet. And yet right in the middle of the book, in chapters 30 to 33, there is a a bright, uh, joyful, encouraging section. Uh, Commentators call these chapters the Book of Comfort or the Book of Consolation. It's kind of a mini section of tremendous joy right in the middle of an otherwise really rather disturbing book. And uh, in these chapters God sets out a bright and a very positive future for his people. He lays out all of the blessings they could possibly imagine. They are terrific chapters to read. What makes them all the more striking is when we realise when they were written. Chronologically, they were written when the Babylonian army was at the gates of Jerusalem. When all hope was gone, and the city was about to fall. So the book of comfort comes against the background of the shouting of soldiers, uh, the clashing of weapons, and the screaming of women and children. And it is against that rather horrifying background that we find in these four verses the Gospel of God. They are, I think, amongst the most profound and the most hopeful in the whole of the Old Testament. Uh, If you like Bible statistics, you'll be interested to learn that these four verses form the longest quotation from the Old Testament to appear in the New Testament. You'll find them in Hebrews chapter 8. Uh, Of all of the hundreds of Old Testament quotations that appear in the New Testament, this is the longest. And uh, this is the only passage in the Old Testament to use the phrase, New Covenant. Therefore, this passage actually gives the New Testament its name, because what we call the New Testament is literally the New Covenant. So the entire second half of the Bible, what we call the New Testament, is actually named after Jeremiah 31. Because in our passage, God comes to his people and he says, I will make a new covenant. And the terms of this new covenant demonstrate the faithfulness of God in the most memorable way. Now that is our subject this morning and I want us to look at the faithfulness of God through the lens of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31 and to do that under three headings. And I believe if we pay close attention to this we will see the faithfulness of God 
in a completely fresh way. So notice first, please, the need for a new covenant. The need for a new covenant in verse 32. In verse 32, uh, describing the new covenant, God says, it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers. Now what was wrong with that covenant? Why did it fail? Why did God say, I'm going to make a new covenant and it won't be like that one? Where was the flaw? Where was the weakness? Well, he tells us, doesn't he, in verse 32, they broke my covenant. Now that was its fatal weakness. The fault was not with the covenant itself, the fault was with the people. And uh, we read in Hebrews chapter 8 concerning the Old Covenant that God found fault with the people. So the flaw was in them, not in the covenant. They broke it. And uh, I'm sure you remember, they broke it within minutes of it being made. I mean, there was Moses up on the mountain still talking with God. The people were at the bottom of the mountain Uh, making a golden calf, worshipping it, and saying, these are your gods, O Israel. I mean, just think of that. You know, the dust was still in the grooves of the letters inscribed by the finger of God on those stone tablets when the people broke it. They broke it as soon as they got it. And they went on breaking it right through Israel's history. They broke my covenant. And, um, friends, that the conquest of Judah by the Babylonians and the exile which followed it is an enormously significant moment in the history of redemption. Because, you see, this was the moment when the hope of Israel died. The people realised that they're finished and that God is finished with them. So, cast your mind back into the earlier part of the Old Testament. Because right from the beginning, the hope had been glowing more and more brightly. You remember God had given Abraham a tremendous promise of a land, uh, and a kingdom, and a destiny. And all the way through the Old Testament, the people have been getting closer and closer to it. So God delivers them from Egypt. The hope is glowing more brightly. God brings them into the promised land. We're getting closer. He drives out the nations. The hope is getting closer. He gives them King David. David defeats his enemies. David captures the city of Jerusalem. The hope is getting closer. His son Solomon builds the most glorious temple for the worship of God and at that moment it seems like we're getting really close to God's salvation. Surely it's almost here. Everything is coming together. God's king, God's reign over God's people, in God's land, for God's glory. And just when we're on the threshold of the hope being realised, everything starts to go wrong. Solomon turns away from God, his descendants become worse and worse, and the nation sinks into a desperate downward spiral of idolatry. Everything seems to be lost. And friends, it's really, really important for us this morning to grasp the significance of the exile. Because, you see, it's not just the external factors. It's not just losing the land. No, it's what God was saying through the events of the exile. You see, God had had called Abraham out of the nations to be his. And now God is, as it were, throwing his people away, throwing them back to the nations. He's letting them go. He is, in a sense, 
reversing the call of Abraham. He took Abraham out of the world and now the book of Jeremiah says he's throwing his people back into the world. I don't want you any longer. You are not my people. And it seemed to Israel that everything was lost. No land, no city, no temple, no worship, no king, nothing. I mean, just imagine in your mind's eye the exiles walking on the long journey to Babylon. They remembered God's promises, of course they did. God had said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. Well, they weren't a great nation anymore. God had said, go to the land, I will show you. Well, they didn't have the land anymore. God had said, I will bless those who bless you. God wasn't doing that anymore. All was lost. And there was no point in trying again. There was no point in saying, well, let's renew the covenant. Because Josiah had tried to do that and it hadn't worked. All was lost. But you see, friends, it was in the darkness of that darkest of moments that God said, I will make a new covenant. And suddenly there is hope once more. Here is something new, something fresh, something different. God is going to act in an unexpected way. The hope of man had been completely extinguished. And the people are saying, only God can help us now. And God says, I will help you. I will make a new covenant. Now friends, I want to say to us this morning that that is precisely parallel to our situation in the 21st century this morning. Because many, many people in our society are coming to the end of their rope. Thoughtful people are frightened at what human beings can do and are doing. Michael prayed about uh, gender-based violence against women and children. But there's climate change, the terrible storms going around the world at the moment, the pollution of the oceans. These things are daily on the front page of the newspaper. And we have technologies that are capable of great harm. And we are neither wise enough or good enough to control them. I mean, we can do things today with computers that are terrifying in their potential. And right on our doorstep here in the Western Cape, uh, crime is out of control, isn't it? Uh, The murder rate is at an all-time high. And as far as we can see, the government is powerless to do anything about it. Yes, we have to say that so-called civilization is unravelling. And thoughtful people are starting to realise that no human leader has the answer. Now friends, in a crisis like that, what you need is lateral thinking. If you've tried five or six different ways to solve a problem and nothing works, you've got to come at that problem from a completely new angle. And the Gospel in Jeremiah 31 is the ultimate in lateral thinking. Won't you please notice where the initiative comes from again and again in the passage? Notice this. God says, I will make a new covenant. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. I will forgive their wickedness. I will remember their sins no more. I will do it. So you see, the hope that's going to lead the people out of the mess is entirely 
in what God does. It's not in anything that we do. So there you have the need for a new covenant. And that brings us secondly to the blessings of the new covenant in verses 33 and 34. What are they? This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. And there are two blessings. First of all, a new nature. God says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Now you see, the people haven't been able to keep the law. They've fallen short, they've broken it. Now what does God do about that? Well, he certainly does not do what governments are doing today. See, what do governments do today when people can't keep the law? Well, I'll tell you what they do. They change the law. Uh, When people can't behave themselves decently in sexual matters, the government changes the law. They bring the law down to the level where they think people can keep it. God doesn't do that. When people can't keep God's law, he doesn't change it. The law in the new covenant is the same as the law in the old covenant. And instead of changing the law, God changes the people. Brilliant. He brings them up to the level where they can obey, where they want to obey, where it is almost natural for them to obey God's law. And therefore, in these marvellous verses in Jeremiah, we have the Old Testament doctrine of the new birth. You see, that's what God is talking about here. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts so that they love it, so that they want to keep it, and they obey it instinctively. I mean, imagine what that promise must have meant to Jeremiah. There he was, preaching year after year to people with very hard hearts. Uh, You don't need to look it up now, you can look it up later. But in uh, Jeremiah 17, verse 1, Jeremiah makes this rather sad comment. He says, Judah's sin is engraved with an iron tool, inscribed with a flint point on the tablets of their hearts. In other words, sin was inscribed on the hearts of the people. And now God says, I'm going to change them. I'm going to give them new hearts. And on on those new hearts, it won't be sin that is written, it'll be my law. And then with this new nature, they will instinctively and naturally want to obey me and they will delight in obeying me. So that is the first of the blessings of the new covenant. It's a new nature. The the second blessing of the new covenant is a new intimacy. Because you'll notice in verse 34, God says they will all know me. Now, of course, they had known God in the past. Uh, The great Old Testament promise always had been, I will be your God, you will be my people. And that's repeated in verse 33 of our passage. But until now, they had only known God at a great distance. They'd only known God through other people. And their relationship with God had been overshadowed by fear. So do you remember how they they pleaded with Moses at Mount Sinai? And they said to Moses, you go and speak to God for us. Uh, Don't let us meet God face to face or we'll die. And they had to go to God through a priest. 
So they brought a sacrifice to the priest and the priest offered the sacrifice. The priest went to God on their behalf. So there was always something indirect, something slightly second-hand about their relationship with God. And so for centuries, many centuries, God had met with his people uh, through priests and prophets and uh, those men had an intimacy with God that was denied to the rest of Israel. And it's very interesting because these mediators are described in the Old Testament as teachers. So Moses is described as a teacher. Deuteronomy 4.14, Moses says, The Lord directed me to teach you decrees and laws. So Moses taught the people, and he would always end his lessons by saying, Know the Lord. The Levites and the priests, they also taught the people. They they went round all the towns of Judah and they taught the people, saying, Know the Lord. The prophets taught the people. So, uh, Jeremiah, of course, was a prophet, and in chapter 32, he says, I taught them again and again. Now you see, the people had to come to these teachers and keep on coming to them. Moses and the Levites and the priests and the prophets, all these teachers taught the people to know the Lord. But in our passage, that situation is going to change. Because God says, look at it carefully, no longer will a man teach his neighbour or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. Because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. In other words, a time is coming when you're not going to need a priest, you don't need a sacrifice, you don't need a prophet, you won't need some other person to go to God on your behalf. You will be able to go to God directly. Everyone will be able to go to God directly. Every man, every woman, every believing child, from the least of them to the greatest, will be able to go to God directly. So, have you got it? These are the marvellous promises of the new covenant. A new nature. I'm going to change the people so that they will love my law, and a new intimacy. They're all going to be close to me, says God. They're all going to know me, from the least to the greatest. Now, friends, if we could really grasp these things, if we could internalise them, because, you see, we have in the Gospel what our society needs today more than anything else if we could only present this gospel in the way that it should be presented, what a difference it would make. I mean, just think of these two blessings with me for a moment. A new nature. You know, we're living in an age where people are wild after personal change. Go into any bookshop and you will find shelf after shelf of books telling you how you can change yourself. Uh, The health and fitness section, just to give you one example, tells you how you can change any part of your body you like. If you search hard enough, I guarantee you will find a book that will tell you how you can change the particular part of your body you want to change this morning. The underlying promise is that it is entirely within your grasp to change yourself. Because that's what people want. It's a huge industry. I mean, think about it. Plastic surgery. Or the endless TV makeover programmes, uh, which tell us how you can change your house, uh, your wardrobe, your career, your marriage, your entire life. All of those things are signs 
of a huge epidemic of personal dissatisfaction. Isn't that right? But you see, we can tell these people about the greatest change of all. A new birth that God can make you into an entirely new person. And we're not just talking about a little bit of plastic surgery. We're not talking about spiritual Botox here. We're talking about a transformation so profound, so all-embracing, that the Bible describes it as being born again. And we can go to people who are dissatisfied with themselves, with their lives, with their circumstances, and we can say, we've got good news for you. Because there is a holy, loving God who can change you into a beautiful, joyful, loving, satisfied, holy person. Now, isn't that a great message? Isn't that what your friends are looking for? Somebody say Amen. Thank you. And what about the other side of it? What about personal intimacy? Relational intimacy? I mean, what a lonely world we're living in. Instead of face-to-face community and friendship, We're inhabiting a world of electronic communication. You know, all those empty promises in social media that have brought multitudes of young people to the brink of despair and even suicide. Uh, If I understand it rightly, within a few years, we're all going to be served by robots. All those mundane tasks that uh, we do today that bring us into some sort of contact with other human beings are going to be performed by robots. Now that might be more efficient. I'm not saying it isn't. But I mean, is that going to build community? Is that going to build meaningful friendships? Well, of course it's not. But you see, you and I can tell people about the best friend in the entire universe. The best friend a person can ever have. God himself. And they can know him. And he knows them more intimately and more completely than any human friend ever will. And he'll never let you down. He'll never fail you. He's always there. He's always understanding. And he's strong and he's wise and he's powerful and he's kind and so you see with God as your friend you need never be lonely again no matter how difficult your circumstances might be now I ask you isn't that the most tremendous message for people who are dissatisfied and lonely A Christ who can make you into a new person and be the perfect friend who never leaves you. Those are the blessings of the new covenant. And so thirdly, it's all because of the mediator of the new covenant. Verse 34b. You see, we haven't actually yet reached the heart of, if you like, the newness of the new covenant. Um, If you've been listening carefully, and I'm sure you have, some of you will have realised that um, you will have realised we haven't got to that newness in the things that we've said so far. So, follow me closely. We've said that one of the blessings of the new covenant is a new covenant. Nature. Now think about it. Did Old Testament believers not have a new nature? Did Abraham not have a new nature? Did Ruth not have a new nature? Well, of course they had a new nature. 
because they couldn't have believed God's promises unless they did have a new nature. And we've said there's a new intimacy with God, and so there is. But would you not say that Abraham was intimate with God? I mean, after all, Abraham is described elsewhere as God's friend. Would you say this morning that you know God better than King David? I don't think I could say that. So what's the difference? Where does the newness come in? Well, you'll find it in the little word for, which literally means because, verse 34b, for, or because, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now this is getting us to the threshold of the new element. Sin is going to be dealt with once and for all. That was the weakness of the old covenant, wasn't it, in a way? The endless rituals, the endless repeated sacrifices were a constant reminder that sin hadn't been finally dealt with. And Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, tells us that the, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. No, for sin to be dealt with permanently, something new has to happen. Now, I know that you know that. But what I'm about to say is the most important part of the sermon. If you take nothing else away this morning, please take this away with you. You see, the newness of the new covenant is the identity of the second party in the covenant. Because in the old, sorry, because in the new covenant, the Father makes the covenant with his own Son. The old covenant at Sinai was made between God and the people of Israel. Notice that in the text, it says it in verse 32. The old covenant was made between God and their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. But the new covenant in Jeremiah 31 is the covenant of grace. It's made between God the Father and God the Son. They are the two parties to the new covenant. And God the Son takes our place and he acts on our behalf. So it's really important to get hold of this, that the new covenant is not directly between God and us. It is between the Father and the Son. So, the Westminster Larger Catechism on the back of your pink question sheet Question 31 asks this. With whom was the covenant of grace made? Answer. The covenant of grace was made with Christ as the second Adam and in him with all the elect as his seed. So Christ is the mediator of the new covenant and that is why the new covenant is unbreakable. What was wrong with the old covenant? They broke it. What is right with the new covenant? Jesus won't break it. He'll never break it. That's why it's solid. That's why it's guaranteed. That's why it's certain to be successful because he will never invalidate its terms. And the foundation of the new covenant is the cross. Because the Lord Jesus said the night before he died, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So, all the curses of our covenant breaking fell on 
Christ. They were absorbed completely forever by his sufferings on the cross so that the covenant would endure and so that we might enjoy its blessings. And that, you see, is why God can say in verse 34, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Now that is the heart of the new covenant. It was made between the Father and the Son, therefore it is unbreakable and it is everlasting. Because Jesus keeps it perfectly and he will never break it. And you see, that's why everything else in our passage fits into place, isn't it? Because the new nature is Christ himself formed in us by the working of the Spirit. And the new intimacy, they will know me in a new way. Well, of course, yes, Jesus brings us into the presence of the Father, you know that. And of course, Jesus leads us to the Father and helps us to know him, you know that. But it's more than that. Because God himself is in our hearts. Christ is in us. We are in him. And our, sort of, our, our, our union with Christ unites us with God in a way that was never possible before. We're closer to God than was ever possible before. And so one of the hymn writers puts it like this. He says, In Christ, the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. In other words, we are better off now in Christ than we would have been if Adam had never sinned. Have you thought of that? We're closer now to God than Adam ever was. Adam walked in fellowship with God. Adam knew God. Adam saw God. But Adam wasn't in Christ. And actually, as we think about it, there's more in this new covenant still to come. We haven't yet reached everything that's promised in this glorious little passage. And while we live on this earth, we can't exhaust everything that's in this passage. You know, yes, this passage leads us to heaven. It prepares us for heaven. God says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And if you're a Christian, God has done that for you. But can I say it is not completely done yet? Because there are other things still in your mind, aren't there? There are other things still in your heart, aren't there? Well, the day is coming when there won't be. The day is coming when there will be nothing in your consciousness but what is completely pleasing to God in every way. Every thought that you and I think will be perfectly holy, guided by Scripture. And every action will be motivated by God's Word. Every action. God says, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. God has done that. And when we come to Christ, we are forgiven. But of course, in this life, we still have to keep coming back for forgiveness every day, don't we? Uh, We have to come to the Lord tomorrow morning and say, Lord, I'm sorry, yes, there are more sins I need to tell you about. And I need forgiving again. But you know, friends, um, a day is coming when you will never need forgiving again. You'll never commit another sin throughout all eternity. Never again will you have to say sorry. 
Never again will you have to ask forgiveness. Never commit another sin. Now friends, we are living in very difficult days and I know some of you have got tremendous battles. Can I say this is the perfect time for the Gospel? And I'm convinced, and I hope you are too, that the only hope for people, the only hope for our world, is the grace of God in Christ. The new covenant sealed in his blood. The new nature, the new intimacy. And you and I have a job to do as Christians which is to call people to faith in Jesus. To tell people about him. To show them how wonderful he is. And that's what I want us to be doing together during our birthday month. Why has God done this? Why has God gone to all the trouble of giving us a new covenant? Why don't you just look back to verse 3 of chapter 31. Verse 3. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I wonder if you can see just how important and profound those words are. Because in one short sentence, it gives us a perfect picture of the faithfulness of God. One writer puts it like this, uh, talking about verse 3, he says, the best proof that God will never cease to love us lies in the fact that he never began. In other words, you see, there never was a time, never was a time, when God didn't love us. And there'll never be a time when he'll stop loving us. And that is how faithful God is. And all of his marvellous promises have been secured for us in the new covenant sealed by the blood of Christ. Well, if that isn't enough to send us away rejoicing this week, I don't know what is. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you and praise you for your amazing faithfulness. We've done nothing to deserve it, but you have kept all your promises to us. Every single one guaranteed by the blood of Jesus. Lord, help us to embrace our new nature more and more, to listen for the voice of your Spirit calling us moment by moment to obey your law and grant that we might delight in our knowledge of you, our relationship with you, in the fact that we know the God of heaven, not as our judge, but as our Father, and can approach you at any time directly with freedom and confidence. And we pray that during our birthday month, you would give us a burden and an opportunity to share this wonderful message with those who most need to hear it. In Jesus' name we pray.